Hello, Rights Flexors. This is Steve Silverman from Flex Your Rights, and today's episode is all about your rights at protests. If you've been following Flex Your Rights either on Facebook or Twitter, you may have already seen the article we posted earlier this week entitled, How to Flex Your Rights at Protests. So if you miss anything from this video, you can always check that out at flexyourrights.org. Okay, we've got a lot of territory to cover. I'm going to break this down into four parts. Part one, protest day preparation. Part two, how to protect your rights if you don't plan on getting arrested. Part three, how to deal with police misconduct. And part four will be my thoughts on civil disobedience and the Occupy Wall Street movement and how well they used it. So, let's get right down to part one, protest day preparation. I want to give you an idea of how an intelligent protester prepares for protests, particularly one where you're going to anticipate large crowds and uh, massive police presence. So before the protests, you're educating yourself about the event. You're going to make a checklist of things you might need in order to be comfortable at the protest and to get home safely, and the organizers should uh, probably help provide such a checklist. So you're going to also remember that your phone isn't likely to work at the protest. So you're going to establish a rendezvous point to meet up with your fellow protesters uh, in case you guys get lost. So that's the first part. But the second part of preparation is much more mental. It's more internal. It's deciding before the protest what you're willing to do and how much risk you're willing to expose yourself to. Because when you're going to be in the middle of a passionate protest, it's really easy to get caught up in the moment and to really lose sense of yourself in the crowd. So you got to be ready to think for yourself. If you're following with a group, it's always cool to withdraw yourself if you think they're just getting a little too close to the fire. So the main takeaways are make a checklist and think for yourself. Okay, part two, how to protect your rights if you don't plan on getting arrested. All right, so you're jamming out at the protestable, you're flexing your First Amendment rights, you're trying to avoid the police, but sometimes the police just can't be avoided. And when it comes to protest, the same rules for dealing with police apply as they would to any other time. But that pressure cooker of a protest simply means that the potential for miscommunication and overreaction uh, on the part of both protesters and police means the likelihood of just bad outcomes is increased exponentially. So. Hopefully, you're already familiar with, with the rules for dealing with police from our earlier videos, so I'll just touch on them briefly. You, of course, always know to be calm and cool during a police encounter. Trying to escalate the level of tension is not going to work in your favor. You know you have the right to remain silent, and that you should use it. You know that you have the right to refuse police searches, that consenting to a police search is like legal suicide you are ready to ask the officer if you're being interrogated, officer, am I being detained or am I free to go? You also know things like never touch a cop because you can wind up getting charged with a felony assault for just touching a police officer. So for more in-depth information on, on your rights during police encounters, make sure you check out our videos um, on YouTube. So if the same rules that protect your rights during any police encounter apply to protest too, other laws prohibiting, say, you know, illegal drug use or vandalism apply as well. I mean, that's the obvious stuff. But there's some less obvious stuff to remember. you got to remember that police generally have the authority to set certain parameters for large events in the interest of maintaining order and protecting public safety. Now, I know it's easy to sort of scoff at these, but they are legitimate countervailing interests. I mean, for example, specific areas during a protest might be declared off-limits to protesters. And this is usually right in front of um, the building or the grounds of the building that's often being targeted by the protesters. Or sometimes police may decide to direct protesters in one direction or another direction, and they do this in order to be able to clear a path for any emergency response vehicles. So the main takeaway of this is that the same rules that apply to police and citizens outside of a protest, the same rules apply inside the protest, too. Okay, part three, dealing with police misconduct. So, despite your best efforts, 
things have turned pretty nasty. Police are shooting tear gas, pepper spray, they're wielding their batons, they're making a bunch of arrests. So, you know, if you are a victim or a witness to any of this, try to do the following things as soon as possible. You're going to be identifying witnesses to get their contact information. You're going to be writing down or using a voice recording app to record everything that happened while your memory is still fresh. You're going to photograph any injuries while they're most visible. You're also going to be using your cell phone or recording device to record the heck out of the incident. I know a lot of folks out there are concerned because a lot of dumb cops are snatching people's phones and arresting them for videotaping the police. But if you're in doubt, videotape the police. So once the smoke is all cleared, you're going to be contacting an attorney before following, filing a complaint with the police. Now this is key because you got to contact that attorney before filing the complaint because sometimes when you file that complaint first, it winds up undermining your case in interesting ways. So you want to contact a cool public interest law firm, you know, the ACLU, groups like the Partnership for Civil Justice Fund. This is a group that recently just won an $8 million lawsuit against the D.C. Police Department for their mass arrest of 400 protesters at an anti-globalization rally in 2002. Now, these are nonviolent protesters. They, a lot of them were journalists and just witnesses, and the police completely overreacted and decided to cordon off this area and arrest everybody in sight. But the key takeaway is to remember that police actions in such situations are subject to review in court to determine if protesters' constitutional rights were violated. So the protest is not the final say. All right, final thoughts on Occupy Wall Street and civil disobedience. Now, flexure rights information, it's primarily focused on how to avoid getting arrested, but sometimes an important cause is helped when committed protesters engage in carefully planned nonviolent civil disobedience. Now, the do's and don'ts of effective civil disobedience, that's going to go well beyond the scope of this video. But protesters who deliberately break the law should carefully consider the costs and benefits of their actions, not only to themselves, but to the cause they support. So please consult with the experts before attempting any civil disobedience, because the experts will agree that intelligent civil disobedience shames your opposition and attracts new supporters to your cause. For example, the UC Davis Occupy protesters, they did an outstanding job. That was a textbook example of excellent civil disobedience. On the other hand, dumb civil disobedience has the opposite effect. It will embolden your opposition. It will alienate your supporters. For example, the Occupy Oakland protesters recently broke into buildings and it was caught on video. They unfurled banners that say, fuck the police. They burned American flags. Now, if I were an agent provocateur hell-bent on discrediting the movement, these are the exact sorts of things that I would do because they, in fact, did manage to lower the public approval rating of the Occupy Oakland protesters. And they then made it easier for the Oakland police to justify their use of force when evicting those protesters. So remember that effective protest isn't just about venting your frustrations. It's about changing hearts and changing minds.